Good morning. We're going to call this special meeting of the City Council to order uh, on Tuesday, November the 28th at 10 a.m. There are two agenda items. I can go ahead, I guess, and announce both of them now. Uh, one will be, well, let's just do number one, um, the home occupation regulation. And I don't know who's going to take over with this. Mr. McDaniel will start uh, yes, us out. Yes, Mayor, I'll go ahead and start. So uh, this item has been through the Paint and Zone Commission, and uh, we we have had an issue with our home occupation ordinance for some time in that um, the court, the municipal court, city attorney found it difficult to enforce because some of the enforcement action is actually implied in the definitions of the ordinance rather than being in the body of the ordinance. So with one exception, uh, staff really views this item as a, a cleanup more than anything else to enable us to enact what we already have on the books um, or enforce what we already have on the books. The one exception is the registering or permitting of home occupations. And so the Plan Zoning Commission has recommended that that be included. Staff does have some concerns about that in terms of cost. Um, and um, there, there's no fee currently associated with it. Um, and just the, the volume of applications that we might receive given the staff that we have today. So not sure that it would be terrible, uh, terribly a lot, a great deal of applications, but um, that is a concern. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sabina, who has um, some slides that she has uh, to review with you. And I know that she sent out some information earlier as well so that you had a chance to look at it. Sabina, I listened to the uh, PNZ meetings where you introduced this, but I had a question, uh, just general question. What was the impetus for this? Was there a complaint that couldn't be enforced, or there are complaints that are not addressed, or I didn't pick that up anywhere? Do you know wh why this came forward to begin with? Well, the, the impetus for this was a code enforcement case okay. on Methodist encampment, and I do have code enforcement staff here with me that could uh, cover some of those details, if you wish. I'm very familiar. Okay. Um, but what what the in in looking at the case and doing the uh, the background research and talking with the homeowner um, uh, from where the uh, where we were trying to address the complaint, uh, we uncovered through working through legal and uh, preparing the case to get all of the um, which we need to do to have a lot of the documentation that we need and to get all of the citations in order. Um, that that we had an issue because we had uh, we didn't have actual prohibitions we uh, there are references to the prohibition um, uh, in within the definition and that's where we started okay. and I'll just step you through the, sure. the a little more in a little more detail here uh, so this uh, the discussion has actually been to the Planning and Zoning Commission six times yes. um, so in April they started talking and, and as as uh, I, as I said, uh, with that impetus uh, and looking at the uh, looking at the ordinance itself and and what can be done, the Planning and Zoning Commission then uh, talked uh, told the staff go forth and do some research and come back to us and the, and the staff did that and prepared a first draft and really kind of put really anything in there that that they found that other cities were doing to give uh, kind of a, a a comprehensive approach, everything but the kitchen sink is what I call it. Um, and, and they did talk about uh, registration, talked about storage, uh, advertising or signage. Uh, the specific uses, what would, would be likely to uh, be a nuisance within the neighborhood, what would be likely to not, and fit within the residential character and uh, have low or, to, or no impact within the residential uh, neighborhood and uh, what do you do with existing with existing uses they had some discussion there uh, there's further review at that at the June 15th meeting and then uh, on July the 6th is when finally the Planning and Zoning Commission felt ready to proceed and and actually have a public hearing on the on the question in September and that's and at that point I joined the team had had joined the team um, there we did schedule had scheduled it for a public hearing 
Uh, and there were some additional changes that the Planning and Zoning Commission discussed. Uh, Mike, uh, Mr. Hayes, our city attorney, uh, also uh, talked a little bit with the Planning and Zoning Commission and, and we drew back and regrouped some. Uh, we did have one person speak um, at that public hearing um, and pointed out a few, a few things that we might want to look at as, a, as the commission. Uh, and so because there were going to be a few changes to the, to the draft, we decided that to be on the safe side, we, we should re-advertise another public hearing, which we did um, on October the 5th. And uh, the commission did recommend approval. I'll just show you the highlights here. Uh, now, one of the things that between the first and second draft, uh, the first and second public hearing, um, that I was looking at was this the question of registration um, and and to be honest I almost took it out um, but I realized that there had been other discussions at the, at the Planning and Zoning Commission level and so I didn't feel right just doing that unilaterally um, so I, I brought it back up as a as a focus uh, point at the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, and uh, there was uh, one Planning and Zoning Commissioner that voted against the re the positive recommendation but otherwise there was a recommendation to uh, to bring this forward to the to the city council with a positive recommendation as it was presented that second time to the planning and zoning commission uh, without a fee though uh, that was uh, I believe in the past discussed that there should not be a fee for the registration the whole reason that it came up as a discussion point was um, and as the staff at the time pointed out was to have an inventory so that we, if we received a complaint, that we would be able to say, okay, at, at this address, we know that there's a home occupation going on and that this is what, uh, what has been basically um, permi permitted in the past. And, and we may have additional information to be able to go back and say, this, these are the conditions under which you said that you were operating, are you still operating under that to kind of start that discussion. So that was the reason behind it. Um, but one of the one of the questions that came up was, well, if we're going to be uh, requiring registration of home occupation, shouldn't we be requiring all businesses to have some type some form of registration through the city and be able to address larger at a larger level, higher level, some additional questions and having you know having a true inventory and not just the picking on the home occupations. Uh, the 25 percent of living area I, I show that as struck out because that was a, another change between the the first and second draft that went to the planning and zoning commission um, that being uh, in in the photos that I passed out to you they're not they won't be on the screen but the photos that I passed out to you actually went to the planning and zoning commission that first at that first discussion uh, time in the spring of this year uh, and you'll see in those photos with one exception I believe just one uh, that they all look like homes and that is the intent of the of the ordinance is to uh, is to allow these home occupations where you cannot tell from the outside that you have a, a business going on on the inside um, definitely certainly your professional type of, of uh, uses uh, also really can, could be more intense as long as you can't tell as a neighbor that that there is a business Conduct, being conducted in that inside the home and so uh, to us it really didn't seem even though the 25 percent limitation is pretty typical across the board in other ordinances I'm not exactly sure where that came from um, but it, it was probably in order to keep the house itself uh, functioning as a home is probably the intent it behind probably that. coincided with the tax code you can deduct up to 25 percent I think if you're could be no. Oh, uh, it used to be 25 percent of your home. Okay. And and we do try when we when we draft these ordinances, we do try to limit any uh, cross pollination that way. If if in case a state law or a federal law changes, that we would still want to be in compliance, and not have to go back and change our ordinances just because some law changed somewhere else. Uh, so we do try to be somewhat generic in that way. I'm sorry, Sabina, could you address the resident employees? What is the, what is the <coughs> consistency of that? Yes, the, um, 
the uh, basically the limitation would be that uh, that anybody that works there actually lives there as well. No that outside. that is the no outside. That's what I was wondering. Right, that you don't have outside employees coming to the home. What what's the history behind the registration without a fee? I'm a bit concerned that we may end up in a fair bit of money. But I, do we have other things that we register or, or do something similar without a fee? Other than trash haulers, uh, just listening to the meeting, the staffs who was Danny Batts at the time was saying that uh, to avoid having to have a, a KPD, an officer, go out, if you get a call, this was what he explained, if you get a call that somebody's doing something and they don't think, the neighbor doesn't think it's legal, KPD or someone has to go out and investigate or um, code enforcement. And um, if you, the thought was, as I heard it, if you register and it's registered as a legal business at that home, then they can look it up online when somebody calls in. Code enforcement could say, that is a registered legal use at that address. And here, if you want to know, are the parameters for that. Well, that still doesn't explain to me why we do it without a fee. Well, just, I guess, the logistics of it. I didn't hear the argument there. Yeah, we don't currently do it, so this would be, if we did it, the Planning Zone Commission is recommending that we don't charge a fee. So the staff does have concerns about just the whole registration process. Well, uh, do we have other things that we do without a similar sort of fee? Not extensively. I mean, you know, some Nothing cities will do, like, garage sale permits or... You know, yeah. fence permits. Other flags. Other flags. <laughs> Where's the okay. flag? Flags. Say again. Feathered flags. Feathered flags. Feathered flags. Emblems and permits. For a period of time throughout the year. And is there a fee for that? No. No? Okay. What is That's the process to register? Do they all, does the city come and check the property or? Well, actually, that's that's not an inventory. That's not a registration process. That's a that's a permit that's that's required, but there's no fee. So when they when they submit for their permit, we will have a record of it with that submittal, but there's there's no inventory that we keep up with. No, no, she, he's asking about home occupation registration. Yeah. What would be the process for that? What would be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They would go to the fill out a form. To development come. services and yeah. I would fill out a form there. So the or could do it on check it all. Well, if we got a complaint, we'd probably go check it out and make sure they had one. But we do that. We do that now if there's concerns about any nuisances or, you know, traffic or what have you, we'll investigate it now. Sabina, do you have any kind of idea? I know this is a, a, a difficult question. Do you have any kind of idea, because we're worried about manpower and that kind of stuff if we register, how many of these businesses we're talking about? I, I'll, I'll tell you that they're few and far between. Um, That's what I, I can, was thinking. But I, I think the, the bigger point is uh, right now we don't really have a good tool if we, do, if we did have an, an issue uh, that, that we, where we needed that tool, we currently don't have it uh, because it's, it's buried in the definition and there's, there's no actual prohibition. There's reference, reference to it and there's an implication that you're, out of, that you're in violation if you don't meet the definition. But it, it's not enough to, uh, to get us through a process if we ever needed to issue a citation. I don't believe that we've ever gotten to that level. If you'll recall from our code enforcement discussion, it, it's, pretty, it's actually fairly rare that we get to that level where we issue a citation. Now, we will. But, um, but because we work so much with a, with a, with a violator or the potential violator that, uh, that they usually come into compliance. In this, in this instance, if we had to go to, to that level, it, it's our understanding that legally we're on really shaky ground and, and, uh, and if somebody really understands that, then, um, then other than getting voluntary compliance, we, we can't get it. We can't go to that level. When, when you did your research on this for PNC, um, before we leave the registration thought, uh, the other communities that you looked at, did they have a registration process? Uh, the ones that I've worked in, we did not. You did not. 
Yeah. I've worked in it where they have uh, special use permits. So it would go through a whole process each time wow. for X number of uh, years or whatever term set by the Planning and Zoning Commission <coughs> Council. Um, the other concern that I have in terms of just enforcement registration is in this day and age, lots of people work from home on the computer. You know, everybody can work anywhere. <laughs> And so I think we have a lot more of this going on than we, we, we understand, uh, just like Airbnb um, or other types of activities in the neighborhoods. When it becomes a problem is when, you know, you have too many deliveries, you've got people coming to your house to um, provide services to them, and, or you've got employees coming to your home, and that, that sort of thing. And then, so, so I think the way that we would envision it, as we've talked, is it's by right as long as you adhere to the requirements of the ordinance that you can't create these nuisances or these problems in the neighborhood. Um, and then if you do, then we've got a, we've got a mechanism to enforce, uh, prohibit it, basically. So here's the deal. How do you get that information? How do you disseminate that? And obviously people don't know because they're not required to register. They, they're working in their house. Somebody complains. They get a telephone call or a knock at the door. And so then they're handed the ordinance and this is what you can and cannot do. Is that the way we envision it working? And they get a warning and they can correct it and they have a time period. Sure. That's, that's pretty much the way it works now. And it's not too much different than a code enforcement violation. Mm -hmm. It's by complaint typically. Um, and we would go investigate and try to get voluntary compliance. If not, then we go through a citation process. Right. And unless it, it's one of the prohibited uses, uh, what we're probably looking at is being very specific to, uh, to making, if, if there's one performance standard that they're not meeting, if they have a, um, an office, for example, but they're having a lot of deliveries uh, for a week or two and, and we get a complaint, we may go out and, uh, we will go out and, and respond to to the to the case, but um, in the conversation might find out well they they just had a pr a week where they're furnishing their office for example, but that is not going to be the typical uh, day to day uh, pr process at that at that location. So we might find out that that is that that one uh, particular uh, issue that they can address very quickly, but not the entire having to cease. And desist the entire, uh, the entire use. And you don't address any kind of grandfathering in this. I mean, once it's passed, it that's the way it is for everyone, right? I, I think you had it listed it's in there. on the first. It's yes. In the new ordinance. It's in the. It talks about specifically what's going to be grandfathered and what won't. Okay. I mean, for me, ultimately, I'll simplify my thinking at the end of this, but we keep talking about, we've, it's been brought up that we don't have necessary authority, I guess, to enforce this stuff now. And I, I guess I don't follow why that's the case. What is, I mean, I understand the difference between definition and, you know, codes of enforcement or whatever, but the way we set this up is, Home occupations are allowable as a conditional use without a permit in any zone. And in our zoning uh, rules, the conditional use permits, it, it exempts these things. And it says it, where it says, but subject to the following stated conditions, home occupations operated in accordance with Article 1, which essentially is the definition. Mm -hmm. Why is that not enough for enforcement of, again, the, we're going to talk specifically about the Methodist encampment guide. Why was that not enough to enforce that? Well, one, you're, you're dealing with regulations in a, in a, in a defined area. Um, you know, you, 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 want, you, want to define, you want to define home occupation and you want a separate section in the ordinance, in the zoning code, that delineates the regulations. Um, and so, Sabina hit the nail on the head. This, the implication is that if you do it 
prohibit against these regulations, it's prohibited, but it doesn't say that in so many words. Um, and you know, the standard to get folks into court is you gotta prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that's a high standard. I know our judges, I know the way our standards, and, and I felt at the time um, we needed to pull this out, put it in its own section. It's not correct to say this is a conditional use. That, that's a defined term in our zoning code. This is just a regulation that applies to home occupation that again is built into defined areas. So we need to pull this out you know, to, to regulate it. Um, and, and, and you all, this is a 97 you know, code that's been amended I think twice. One, um, once in 2000 and another time in um, 2007. And that was, that was really the only time I looked at it, and that was gunsmithing, because we had an issue that someone wanted to, to you know, use their home and, and do a home occupation with gunsmithing. So I, I'm telling you, from my, my opinion, this would have been a waste of time, and, and, and to, to take this and that specific case into municipal court and cite them for that. And so that's why we've been talking about this for a year, year and a half. And, and backing up for a second, because I've written s many code enforcement letters in, in my time, and the first thing that you do is you explain, uh, you explain how it's defined, but the second thing you do is you cite the section that prohibits that. And that's the problem even for us starting out without, with it bef well before we involve legal is to help us through that, through the court process. And we, and we do that quite a bit. We don't involve uh, Mr. Hayes' office every time, uh, every time we're looking at. Now, if we get close to having to issue a citation, we'll give them a heads up. But just writing that, just writing that letter, the warning or the explanation. So if I'm, if I'm conducting the home occupation, then okay, I don't meet the definition, well, so what? Is okay, but, the, but is, as far as that, you would cite the code. So the code is in the residential zone, are you allowed to do commercial business? Am I allowed to do a vehicle maintenance business in a residential zone by right in that zone? No, but okay, if somebody's so living there and saying, well, my use is residential. My use is a home. It's my house. I just, I, but I'm also operating a car repair shop out of it and, and so it's it's allowable then you're saying vehicle yeah. I mean couldn't we have solved that by simply saying well I'll hold this to the end because this is where I kind of wrap up I, I think a simpler way of dealing with this but keep going through your and, explanation I'm sorry and Sabina I guess in the current one it says has no more than one employee who isn't a member of the immediate family to work there and this new one says absolutely none uh, I know of an incident where uh, 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 there's a happens to be an elderly man who uh, quite wealthy who has a little office in his home and he has a lady who comes in and does his clerical work for him so that would be illegal under this uh, uh, the way that it's written in the draft yes I can yeah. imagine that would be an issue to have a lady come in or man either one to come in and help with some clerical issue well truth is or is, would is we just it? say that that's that's parallel to having somebody come in and clean your house well that's right you've had somebody come that's in exactly. and do a service for you it's right. not running a business in your home it, it's a service that they're coming to provide yeah but they're you're the receiver of the service that's, so that's, a, that's different than you running a business that's what i mean yeah so but if i'm if i'm having somebody do clerical work for me for your business, for my business, then that's, but uh, that's I'm presuming that this man is is having this done for his own personal stuff. He's a nonprofit serving other people. He's serving other people oh, as a nonprofit. Well, the truth is, by this definition, we're going to have to everybody that with the registration focusing on that, everybody that brings work home to work on is technically doing home occupation because they're doing their business at home. So they would technically have to register to do that. Just something to think about, that's all. Carry on. I've got, I've got a question, Sabina. Uh, one of these houses I think I recognize 
they, uh, the owner owns the house and works out of it but lives somewhere else, is that going to be allowable? Well, the, the primary use would still have to be would still have to be a residential in a residential district. The, the key is that it's a home occupation. Well, that's not allowed now. This is a home occupation. You're, you're using right. it as a home. You're occupying it as a home. You're doing a, a business out of the home. So no, that's not, that's not legal now. It's basically an accessory use. So is your uh, uh, illustration on Elm Street currently occupying the home and running a child care out of it? On Elm Street? I believe so. Let me confirm that. On Elm Street? The, all of the addresses of the photos that uh, we took, I, I got all of those off of uh, Google. So I do Google daycares. Those are the addresses that came up. But, the, but yes, they, they would have to also be living there. So the operator must be living there. In other words, at night, the house is not empty. So uh, one by one, the uh, body and beauty needs, you're selling, that's a business, that's a retail or wholesale? I know firsthand that that is a, uh, she runs a spa. Okay, so that would be illegal. And the lawn care? Illegal? No, no, no. Under she, this? You're saying she lives in that house. She lives in the home. Yeah. She does that's in the But home you can't have retail has. sales on this ordinance. It's prohibited. She, do, sorry, she does live in the home, but she does run a oh. spa out of her home. So under retail wholesale, that would not be allowed, or barber, beauty, or nail prohibited. Correct. Yeah, that's from, what we're from saying. From the list, correct. Okay. And the lawn care business would be prohibited. I don't see any equipment there, but we, that you couldn't do. That's not repair. That's lawn care. Right. So. That's His home office is there in his home. He lives there, but his office is there. At the and home. so that would be okay under this? Yes. Okay. I'm just going one by one to just see. Uh, unless they have... A lot of storage right. where, where it's getting out of the norm. It got you. And the architectural business is legal, <coughs> would be legal. The child care would not. Is that right? Or would be? It, it would be. It, it, it would be. Now, if they're getting into a commercial child care, if they're getting, getting into that area and they're not actually not living there anymore, it's not a home as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is some, some cross pollination there because um, because there are state regulations that define a child care and when and when there need to be additional employees there when when the home actually needs to change uh, and and there needs to be a commercial kitchen for example with hood vent and things like that so there you can with child care if you have a lot of children there you start to get into regulations where you can no longer meet these performance standards Okay, under your summary statement where you have equipment, nuisances, deliverance, and traffic, certain times of day, depending on the number of children being cared for, there would be additional traffic otherwise than normal. Is that correct? Yes, and that was, and that was one of the discussion items at the Planning and Zoning Commission level, which was at, at some point some of, some of these regulations do become a matter of interpretation. And, and may need to have further discussion and a lot of documentation on how we reach that uh, that decision that this this level of traffic and would probably involve engineering and making sure that uh, that whatever analysis we have conducted uh, that it's reasonable <coughs> that that they really have gone above and beyond the the what what is a reasonable expectation for traffic on that street. We don't have a number right now that is an absolute standard attached to that. What we're looking at here, this, this document, is current. The, yes. Correct. What was at your place? Yes. And do we have a copy of the proposed draft? No. I'm sorry, I because don't have that right now. That it, I believe it was emailed to you a couple of weeks ago. We can make copies of it. Yeah, 
planning and zoning then is of October 5th, if you don't have it separated out. Trace in, they, they probably get it faster. If you could trace in to the planning and zoning October 5th um, meeting, the packet, it's in there. <coughs> if I could print off one thing, I could give it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, what would you be asking? from us today so uh, we have this scheduled tentatively for uh, first reading at your first meeting in January and then uh, second reading second meeting um, but we don't have to if you guys want more time with it um, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that that's the purpose of the work session is get everything out of the table any concerns okay um, and so that we can bring something to you all that's been properly vetted that's and going to the cold if they pull this up and print it I, I would like to make some suggestions based on it. Okay. But I think I think we can simplify this process if we looked at it a little more generally instead of so specific. Um, Mark, why don't you go ahead and tell what you're going to? Well, it's, it's going to it's going to make. I mean, generally speaking, is is this? I mean, the goal of this whole deal, as I understand it. Um, is to somehow create um, the res or preserve the residential character of the residential zones. That's really what mm -hmm. we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the goal, then just kind of keep our eye on the ball. And it really should be as simple as any otherwise legal activity. So we're not saying you can like do a legal activity, but any legal activity done completely within the confines of the property that are not perceptible from the outside the property, sight, sound, smell, I mean basically, should not be a concern to the city. So if whatever they're doing is not affecting the outside, we shouldn't concern ourselves with it, right? I mean, we, we can't enforce it anyways, so, so the, generally speaking, that would be the goal. And so, um, Instead, instead of doing these, um, focusing on home occupations, when you see what they bring out, it'll make more sense. But um, just take the regulations that we are putting under home occupations and apply them to the residential zone. Say we prohibit this activity in a residential zone. For instance, one of the things that we're gonna talk about specifically aimed at home occupations is outside storage, okay? So rather than making that a requirement that I'm, I'm only prohibited from doing it if I've got a home occupation, I should be prohibited from doing it in a residential zone, period. Because outside storage is what is detracting from the residential character of that zone. As, it's, as we're doing it now, we're gonna, reg we're gonna prohibit outside storage if the guy has a home occupation. But as a, just a resident, we're not prohibiting. It is, isn't it? Code enforcement, isn't it already? Well, if it is, then we don't. Some of then it it's redundant to be putting it under. If, if it's considered That's junk or oh, okay, but, but or the point, trash. The point is, we don't need to add complication to our codes if because we can there. already enforce that as being illegal in the zone, mm -hmm. right? If it's considered junk or trash. Okay, okay but the but point. I don't the, believe. But okay. that's my point. It, we should be regulating it under the zone, not under the, oh, the, the cause of what's happening in the zone. I think what you're saying is if it's illegal for a home occupation, it should be illegal for everyone. In the residential zone. And does that mean that you can't keep a, a, a riding lawnmower out somewhere in your backyard? Am I correct? Yeah, is that illegal now? Yeah, I think the general, I, I see where you're going with mm -hmm, that. It makes, right. it makes a lot of sense. but. I, I think that the general idea behind the differences between home occupation and then everybody else is that, uh, and you kind of are getting into it, Mayor, is, you know, a person's home is their castle. They can do with, if as long as they're just living there and it's residential, there's more liberal uses, okay? If it's theirs, if they're belongings in the yard, if they're 
you know, the way they landscape, the whatever, it's theirs. Um, but when you begin to use your home as an enterprise to make money, then you are prospering, theoretically, at the expense of your neighbors if it's creating issues. If it's creating issues, exactly. So, so the point is, to her point about a lawnmower, if, if me as a homeowner having one lawnmower outside is a problem, taking away from the other people's property rights or values or whatever, then it's irrelevant <coughs> whether I've got a home occupation causing that infraction or not. And so with things like um, signage, okay, we are going to allow signs uh, under this new thing. We already do, I guess, but we're gonna allow signs in a yard, uh, a certain size, whatnot, for a home occupation. But putting an advertisement of any kind, even if it just says my business, detracts from the residential nature, character of this zone. So why are we allowing a sign? If it's a home occupation, then the idea is that there should be no outward appearance, nothing perceptible from the outside world, that there's an occupation going on in there, because that is what takes away from it. And the example here is, is the architect. He doesn't need a sign because any business he's doing architecturally, it's not like an advertisement. I'm not driving around looking for an architect by the sign in his yard. So it's not going to take away from his livelihood to just say, we don't want signs in the residential zones that are commercial signs. Um, so that's, that's a simplification. We don't need to put that in there. Just put it in the zone. You know, and when when they get them, you'll, you, the prohibitions that are there that we're putting under home occupation, all we have to do is slide them in under the zone, make them prohibitions in the zone, and we, we're accomplishing the same thing with less uh, grief, if you will, and less administrative effort by code enforcement. Yeah, I would say that in many cases we do, and, and those are your code violations. Yeah, but well, it's not it's not a one for one, but it in general we already do. If, whether it's noise, well, even if or you, smell, or right, what have you. Even if we don't already, what I'm suggesting is any of these that are additional are really aimed at a residential zone code. And so, if they are redundant, we don't need to move them. If they're not redundant, then we add them to, to residential zone prohibitions. So. And if we want to further, because one of what they'll print will show like seven or eight prohibited businesses, uh, business Animal types. Animal breeding. Yeah, example. okay. So if you want to prohibit those as a home occupation, just prohibit that activity uh, in a residential in zone. In a residential zone. And be done with it. You know, and so, you know, as far as telling people what they have to do, you know, we're, we're not... We don't have to do anything. It just it just gets complicated. Here's here's an example from another city. Okay. Um, a woman cooked, and she liked to cater things, and so it became a business to her. Okay. And then she decided that not only would she cater at other places, but on Sunday afternoons, she would invite people to her house. Okay. The neighbors began to throw a fit okay. because the whole street was blocked up with traffic. Okay. I think. We could hardly say you are not allowed to block up the whole street with traffic or what's going to happen to the next family reunion or the next party. Okay. It does get to be a difference between whether you're doing it to make money or you're just doing it in the course of your life. Okay, but the complication yeah. becomes how do you enforce whether they're doing it to make money or not? Because if I'm doing it... Well, she's charging people to come and eat. Okay, but how are we going to know that on the Family phone? reunions, you don't. Um, well, but that's what I'm saying. See, that's the gray area. So, 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 so why we investigated. So we had a rule that says you can't do that in a residential zone. So it was easy to say to her, "You've crossed the line." That's what he's saying. You can't yes, but, change but, see, it. but that situation would end up being prohibited in a residential, in a residential zone. zone as as saying you can't do commerce in a regular in a residential zone. If that's what you want to do, that's that's what you end up doing. So like a consultant is not actually doing business transactions in the residential zone, but a caterer is actually, it's not retail, but it's a 
business transaction that's occurring in the re you regulate it that way. I mean, you can get at that and still not, because the flip side of this is, um, I, I don't know if they, yeah, traffic. Okay, so home occupations shall not increase the traffic volume. This is the what the proposal is mm -hmm. going to be. So home occupations shall not increase the traffic volume on the street on which the business is located above typical residential street capacity. Okay, so what we're really trying to do is prevent blocked up streets, mm -hmm. okay? But are we then gonna start going after the person who is blocking up the streets, not for commercial uses, but frequently? I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a party every week. It's just a party, it's not, I'm not doing business. This is, I'm creating a traffic nuisance frequently, but you, I'm allowed to, and a guy that's making money isn't. You know, that's the kind there's of a number of Bible studies that do that too. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's weekly. there's legitimate things that go mm -hmm. on that we don't want to regulate, but, or we don't want to prohibit, mm -hmm. but um, but we do actually want to regulate. Noise is another one. Um, you know, a nuisance created, uh, creation of excessive noise, odors, vibrations, whatever, um, which is detectable outside the structure shall be prohibited. See, that seems to me not relevant whether the noise is created by home occupation or not. That's the residential character that is being affected. So that would be something that we try and enforce under the residential zone and not tie it to home occupations. Well, I, I, I do think it gets dicey though. So under nuisances, so for example, the, the idea of odors and fumes, if it's my home and I, you know, my family comes over at least once a month and we barbecue, mm -hmm. there's lots of smoke. Right, no, you're, you're talking about validity of the actual nuisance prohibition, okay, but that's still not relevant to whether it's a home occupation or not, because I'm going to be your neighbor, and whether you're running a home occupation or not, if you're cooking some god-awful food out there, <laughs> and I don't like it, I don't care if you're running a business, I just want the smell gone. So if, is the city able to enforce that, whether you've got a home occupation or not? Probably not. So we shouldn't even try it under home occupation because it makes no sense. Um, but you know, some of these just, like I say, I think we're complicating it by trying to make this narrow thing that creates a situation of residential zones where it's, um, if I don't tell you that I'm doing a home occupation, then I'm able, to, or if I'm not doing home occupation, then I'm able to do some of these things, clearly detracting from the residential character. But if I register a home occupation, I'm not. It doesn't make sense. So Sabina, how many of these things, for instance, uh, on, under on page eight, would be prohibited in a residential zone, period? Like you said, this, the odor, the, the noise, the traffic, are those things already? Well. We've got we've got really two things that we're proposing here, and and one is the the list of per, uh, uh, prohibited uses and list of permitted uses, but the second thing are those uh, performance standards, and I think those uh, so uh, so if you can address if if you have a home occupation and it is not on this on this use list, um, so it's it's a permitted home occupation, and and it's just one of these standards. Say you have a lot of uh, say you have five lawn mowers out there. If you come back and, and you restrict that or you put them where we can't, there's no outside storage of those things, you can address the issue and yet still keep your home occupation. And, and if, I could, if I could rewind here for just for a second, uh, the, the whole concept, and this is kind of planning 101, the, the whole concept of nuisances versus specific standards in a zoning ordinance uh, was discussion early, early on before with the with the early uh, zoning ordinances. Can't we just address these things through nu nuisance law? And um, and I think some of the some of the early uh, municipalities that were that were playing around with with zoning law uh, at first were trying to go in that direction, but with the complexity of uh, and the and the evolution of what zoning came to be. Uh, uh, there was a recognition that we needed standards um, and and that it needed to be divided and needed to be more complex than than just nuisance because um, 
what might be a god awful smell to one person might not to the other, for example. Uh, to to and, and reasonable minds could differ, and that's where that's where you come up with these standards that are a lot more understandable. That are there may be some gray areas and some room for inter interpretation, but you ha you do have a lot of the time written in black and white what you can and cannot do. Pretty easy to understand. Of course, you do need to get roll up your sleeves a little bit sometimes, but then also to have these performance standards against which just about anybody ha is on notice against which they, those would be measured. Now, again, with the home occupations, simply prohibiting animal breeding, for example, sure, right now you cannot have an animal breeding service in a residential district if it's freestanding. However, if you're making the argument, I live there and I just have, and I, that's, my, that's my business that I have, but my primary use is my home. We would have a very difficult argument and I, would suspect also getting through municipal court if it comes to that uh, to to make that case to make and and what we're trying to do here is really to help us in this in the instances where we really need it and those are very rare but but when we do need it at least we have that tool okay but but just to grab up the example you gave animal breeding okay we're going to prohibit it here and I guess what you're trying to say is that if it's listed as a home occupation, if we define it as a home occupation, then we can prohibit it. But if we don't define it as a home occupation, we cannot prohibit animal breeding in a residential zone. Is that what you're trying to say? If the, if the homeowner that makes the argument, up. my use is really a home, I'm doing that as my business out of it, but, I'm, but my primary use is a home, uh, okay. from, right. from a code enforcement standpoint, I would have a very difficult, uh, difficult time making that okay. case. And, and, and then the next question I would ask would be, again, back to the original, if they're doing animal breeding within their, the confines of their home, then why do we care? I mean, if, because right now, I mean, all the nuisance aspect of animal breeding, I assume, I, I could be wrong, would be the, you know, the barking, maybe the smell, I, I don't know. I mean, what would, what would we care as long as it's not affecting us? But you can make the argument that I don't need to be breeding animals to be a nuisance to my neighbors if I just let the dog out in the yard. Or even if it's fenced in, if I got a Rottweiler out there, it's creating a, a danger zone to the next door neighbor, even if it's inside the fence. You know, but we can't regulate that, so why are we trying it here? We do have a limit on the number of pets, don't we? We do, it's for four. household. Yeah. <laughs> If you got four fish in your tank, that fifth one, you're, you're out of the box. <laughs> They're, They're inside. Huh? They're inside. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the rule. But, um, but in any case, so, you know, I would ask that of those. As long as it's not perceptibly affecting the outside world, why are we even trying to regulate it? Well, I, I will tell you that this list, where, where this list came from, I mean, certainly there are other ordinances, too, that oh, in the research. Uh, however, uh, these make it to the list usually because of their, their very high likelihood of, of quickly becoming an issue and, 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 um, and very easily not being able to meet those, those, or very quickly not being able to meet those performance standards at all. Uh, the Barber and Beauty and Nail Salon, for example, because of the chemicals that they use. Right. And the well, equipment that I they mean, need. Specifically, I mean, I'm, I'm not looking to even debate each one of those individually. I'm just saying that it doesn't debunk the argument that this as a separate, the, the standards of operations as a separate set of rules are no more enforceable under home occupation than they are under the residential zone. You know, you, you describe the nuisance problem, the you know, problems with enforcing nuisance uh, laws, you're going to have that same problem under home occupation as you would in residential zone. So I don't see us benefiting by adding complication. And I do see us benefiting by simplifying. Because um, I, I assume the idea behind the amendment would be to get us a better result than, than we have now. And I'm not sure that we accomplish that by leaving it out under home occupation. I, mean, I, don't, I don't understand the enforcement uh, process.
problems with just pushing it to zone to the zone. So we 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 prosecuted the case on Methodist encampment, for instance, and prevailed. Other, you, yes, ma'am. Uh, other nuisance conditions. I mean, junk stuff. You know, debris piles. And, and we have a history against them. So um, that yeah, that was part and parcel. We we could kind of um, exclude the home occupation at the time, but that was. So under what uh, circumstance w were they prosecuted? Um, under what law? They were prosecuted under the just the carport thing. Well, we didn't actually go after them Set over the vehicle. Setback. It was just the carport issue because when we went out for the home occupation, he had a buddy there, and the buddy said he does, or he, him too, said he did not do work out of his home. However, if you look on the website, he does have a website stating that he does Riley's Repair. But we could not prove that he was actually selling or doing repairs for somebody else. So the trailers that are now in the yard, they're also a code he violation. He says that they're, they're his. But they're a code violation, right? Because right. they're in the grass. Okay, okay so let's, let's fast forward. So we've got this same uh, citizen doing the same activity. And we create a situation where you have to register your home occupations. So and that's supposedly going to get us enforcement on him. So he just says, I'm not going to register because I'm not a home occupation. We are still stuck not being able to do anything, right? But it's his interpretation whether it's a home occupation or not, right? Or no? Well, no, not necessarily. Through, through their office, I mean, it's just like uh, a police officer collecting evidence. We, yeah. You know, in, in this case, and I don't know all the specifics, we would go to that website. So he takes um, the website down, and we're stuck again, right? No, not. I mean, we would have here's, to just here, collect here's my, evidence. Here's my nefarious way around it. I jokingly have explained this analogy to other people, but let, let's say, I'm not suggesting I'm going to do this, right? Okay, just so everybody's clear. But let's say that whatever the business is that's prohibited, um, it, it, it's only a home occupation if, if it's commerce, correct? I mean, we don't have to register unless money is trying to change hands, right? Okay, so let's say in his, in his case, he's doing all the uh, auto mechanic work um, essentially for free, and he's gonna charge me when he, uh, for delivery service of a, a bill. So I'm not doing auto mechanic work for money, I'm doing a delivery service. So I drive to the guys, I'm the auto mechanic, and I drive to his house with my invoice. And the guy pays me $1,000 for my invoice because we all know with a wink and a nod that that's what's going on, but we can't, we couldn't enforce anything, could we? I mean, we're forcing it onto us to prove, we have to be there when money changes hands to actually enforce home occupation, right? But we could enforce vehicle maintenance being done in a yard through residential zone prohibiting that activity, could we not? I mean, can't well, we, can we do that? There. I mean, again, we have to build cases. Okay, but and we would go into court with evidence, and hopefully, in that instance, we have the judge or the jury see right through that and go, "Look, you you don't just because you're not taking money for the the lawnmower repair, but you're taking money for the delivery. Come on, um, you know, Mr. Brady, they're they're kind of quote unquote perfect crimes, but we try to you know through law enforcement, we try to get through those. We have a case right now that they're working on where the guy <coughs> is, we think allegedly living in the backyard in an RV. But he's not there during the day to prove that up. They have to go by at night and take pictures of this guy living in the RV. And then we can't see him in the RV. And so we're, we're, they're taking pictures of the lights being on. They're taking pictures of a, of a refrigerator there. We have, all that's going to be you know, arguably circumstantial. But we're going to present that at some point, hopefully to a judge or a jury. And we're going to say, this is our case. OK, so you just actually explained what I'm trying to avoid, which is we don't want to go to court, right? We want to enforce what we want to enforce without having to do that, right? We, let, let me just say, now's a good time for me to say, I, I don't know, you know, I'm providing legal services to counsel. And so when this, my point here is when, when this came up, I haven't gone through this word by word because I've been waiting for you all to figure out, right. you know, what, what do you want to do this? But you're absolutely right. What you're getting at is we want a, a, a law that everyone can understand. Right. Because 99.9% so, .9 of us are going to understand that and go, okay, so 
So if I've got a home occupation, these are the parameters with which I can do a home occupation. It's the 0.1% that we can say, well, we've got very clear standards, and here's what you're violating, and then we, and if they don't come into compliance, then we can cite and go into court, and I can prove that up, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. So the reasonable doubt goes away if we stick our, if we stay focused on, on the ball, which is perceptible variance from residential character. So. Are we able to, this is, I guess, a, this is a legal question, are we able to enforce a code that prohibits vehicle maintenance out, on my driveway or in my garage with the door open? Are we able to actually enforce a code in a residential zone saying we prohibit that activity, the visible activity? Are we able to do that? Are we able to write a code that prohibits that? Vehicle maintenance? Yes. I think we can define okay, it. Okay, so right. as a zoning. As, as a, sure. uh, right, so, so that's, that's my point. So to me, all of these should be aimed at specific codes so we don't have to go check, investigate a website because we don't, we don't want to try and do that. We just really want to get them, prevent them from doing the visible thing that's affecting the residential character. My argument with that, George, is that you still get into the complication of um, distinguishing between me changing my oil on my driveway mm -mm. every no, 5,000 miles. I don't, and here's why. And somebody doing it all day, every day. Yeah. I, Those are different. One changes the, the residential character of my neighborhood. I would argue that my changing my oil, well, that's going to be once every several months, does not change the residential character of the neighborhood. So. You, somebody's going to have to get in there and define. No, they won't. Here's, to what here, extent? Here, here's why. Just talk. Just talk practically in terms of those. Okay, we're not trying to stop the shade tree mechanic. Okay, mm -hmm. but the scenario would be changing an oil, changing oil. <coughs> That's going to take me an hour, maybe two, to do. I'm going to do it once every few months. Maybe I start doing it, and they call code enforcement. Code enforcement comes <coughs> out. Or, or maybe my neighbor sees me do it and doesn't do anything about it. I, I, I would argue that we probably don't even have to worry about it. However, if I'm a shade tree mechanic and I'm changing my engine, I'm pulling the, the head off and everything in my driveway, even if it's only for a week, I would argue that's something we don't want to have happen. And the amount of time it would take me to do that would be, would be something that would get stopped. And so I don't think we even have to worry about those details. But bigger than that, worrying about those details are not um, complicating this. Still, we're better off moving these out of home occupation and into residential zone because there's still going to be holes through that, but there's less holes than we are if could, we leave could, them in. Could we do this with, with, I think, all this in mind? Uh, because Mr. Hayes said that he hadn't really spent a lot of time because I understand we don't know if this is something we want to pursue or not. I think it's absolutely necessary that we do something that has teeth to prohibit retail sales and some of these things as an occupation in a residential neighborhood. I was just reading on the Connect News thing there's something called a residential um, neighborhood conservation uh, uh, committee that was formed in a community for this very reason. We have a lot of other things for our subcommittee to look at on neighborhoods, it renters policies, this kind of thing. So I think it's necessary to look at how do, how do we best restrict and preserve the character, as, as you said, and that's a good a term, of the neighborhood. It's important. And how can we best and most simply do it? So this would be my hopes that Mr. Hayes could do. Yes. I would hope that we could come together on saying if they're doing something for a trade that's a nuisance, we need to look at the best way. Whether it's the zoning code, whether it's this vehicle, we need to have you analyze that, Mr. Hayes, and say this is the most effective way to do it. Some of these things are going to, I think, always be subjective. Traffic, how do we know if something increases the, the traffic? I had a neighbor who received um, a personal products delivery for her home every other day. She doesn't live there anymore. It was a UPS truck. Didn't bother me too much. They were there a few minutes and gone. I don't know what she was doing with it. 
You know, I don't know if she was reselling it. Maybe she was Mary Kay. What happens to the Mary Kay people, you know, who have studios where they keep products and that sort of thing, and it's all neat and nice. So, you know, I think we need to look at what's our best way to keep neighborhoods preserved, safety. I think you simplified it, Sabina. I don't know the answer to that. I think that's something Mr. Hayes has to bring to us. Do we do it this way, or do we do it in a zoning? in the residential zoning. Um, well, unless I'm hearing a consensus about doing something different, this is the way that we would approach it is through a home occupation. And, and I, I think it's because of the issue of, again, as I said earlier, a person's home is their castle. They can do what they want there. And, and it's even if they're changing an engine for a full week, it's their place. Sure. And they do it all over town now. Right. But when it becomes a business, that's quite different. Um, so we would still approach it as a home occupation, certainly tighten it up, um, as Mike has suggested and you have and others, but I, I, don't, yeah. I, want, I don't want us to go away and wonder what we should be doing. So right. th but this is what, we're, unless you guys tell me otherwise, that's the direction that we would be going, is, is trying to um, polish it up a little bit in terms of what we have today. I think it both accomplishes a purpose, but people need to know you can't run a business in your in, in a residence that's going to make a nuisance for somebody else, plain and simple. I, I don't see why you couldn't have a lady or a man or a young person, student, come into your home and do some clerical work with one uh, vehicle. I don't understand why that's an issue. That may be something we look at collectively. Um, but this question of whether we need an ordinance or an amendment to the zoning ordinances, staff is, feel strongly that we need a separate ordinance, not just amendment to the zoning requirements. That's our recommendation. The best way to okay. identify. Okay. And, the, and the reason is ease of enforcement or? Yes, because it gets very complicated in terms of is it for me or is it for personal benefit as commerce and and if we just go straight with the zoning and it's for me you know I'm gonna have a hard time seeing anybody out trying to enforce somebody's barbecue once a week we well, wouldn't do that on that though. that's the thing it, 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 that's not something that we're gonna enforce whether it's home occupation or not that's the point there's really on these standards of operation there's really only three or four that you actually or, attempt, or can even enforce under home occupation. Employees, you'll never be able to enforce that because we'll never know that they have employees or not. We would. We could. How? I mean, yeah, how we, will you we know? We would investigate. It, yeah, but you, but you that, that's what I'm saying. The, 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 and, and the employees may never be at my house, and so that shouldn't be regulated. Like, if, I've, if I'm running a business that it's just my home office, like I forget who the example was, then we would never care about the employees because they never actually come to that office and so this has to be designed a little different well storage you, all I'm saying is that moving these to doing it under zoning actually is easier to enforce and you get to enforce just as much if not more than you're doing right now I, and I you retain the character of the residents yeah, respectfully respectfully I think that it would be more difficult because we've got then staff trying to make calls about gosh you know this is not a business, but I got a complaint, and they're really just it's, it's gray area, lots of gray area. Well, what, why would there be a gray area? Because I call up and I say, hey, they got some outside storage over here next door to me. You don't care whether they're home occupation. You know that's something to cite. What's, what do you define as outside storage? Well, that, that's defined under the same, that, that problem is defined, is the same problem whether it's home occupation or not. It's still outside storage. So you have to define that specifically, whether it's under home occupation or simply under the zone. Okay. So that problem is, George, is not. But, but, but what, no, if we, what if we get real simple and we say the council's job is to set policy. Our policy is that residential character of neighborhoods will be maintained. That's what we want to do. Mr. Manager, do it. Then the manager comes to us and says, here's how I recommend we do it. Why would we say, no, no, no. Do it okay. a different way. Right. Our job is to say, here's what we want. Here's the, here's the goal. Go do it. And when he says, this is how I want to do it, okay. 
Okay, because this particular one has got two parts to it. One is the first part, which is we want to be able to regulate the, the zones. Um, you know, resi we're trying to maintain the residential character. The other is, because the next step, if this is more complicated, which I'm pretty sure that it is, if this is more complicated, the next thing that's gonna come along is they're gonna go, we don't have enough manpower in code enforcement to enforce this more complicated code. And that's something that we as council are gonna end up having to make a decision down the line. So if right now we well, could short circuit that let's question. Wait, let's wait and see if that evolves because really they think okay, well, see, it's gonna make their job easier and less time consuming. Let's give that a chance to play out since they're the ones who are doing it. But let's, you know, in my kitchen, I say, if I ask you to peel potatoes, you use a peeler or you use a knife, that's your choice. I just want the potatoes peeled. Yeah. Why, yeah. why would I care how they do it if it gets done? And then if they come and tell me, oh, but we got a $50 potato peeler, then I say, uh-oh, no, 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 you just do it with a knife. Yeah, it's, it's not actually, um, it's not micromanaging. This is actually what I'm attempting to do is manage. I didn't and, use it. No, I know, I did. <laughs> and what I'm saying is that rather than wait and see, I'm taking a, to use the code enforcement's word, a proactive approach to handling a situation. So bottom line, your, your concern is budget, is that this is gonna take more people. No, no, actually, <laughs> bottom line is my. I was just trying to move myself up. It's all right. Um, it is efficiency. And, and efficiency in codes. And I think this is, is both redundant, inefficient, and more complicated than it has to be. And to everybody's original thing, we talked about sign norms, we talked about these, the complications in our codes are ridiculously large. And this is an opportunity for us to, rather than explode them, we can shrink them and accomplish the same goal. So I would say it's efficiency, not budget. And Okay, well that, that makes it clear. And that then maybe um, I should say to um, the staff, I don't agree with that point of view. So from my standpoint, the, um, the staff should continue to refine this. And I'd like to hear a lot more conversation about registration and fees. And, and maybe why we could get away, we could do without that. Okay. And if we have time. And because if, that does sound to me like a big mm -hmm. nuisance and, and a questionable value. Mm -hmm. If you have time, if you could have that subcommittee address that first, maybe they would you mean have it's some. A comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would have some input. Yeah, they're probably not going to get to that until spring. Oh. Yeah. Because that's when they start getting to the actual action items. And they're I not going to have time to get really deep <coughs> in the weeds on each each item, it's gonna be more like, we think we should look at this, that, and the other without really a whole lot of study about it, because they won't have time, they have three meetings. So. Okay. Sabina, do we have an idea of how many businesses will be affected if we move forward with this? I would imagine rel uh, relatively small number. It's, uh, again, it's really more, uh, we're trying to get at the more egregious cases. And as uh, Mr. Hayes pointed out, uh, being able to, for me, it's really all about building a case, being able to build a case if it has to get to that point. And, and they are few and far between. They do make, uh, they, they do have a large impact, however. So um, uh, if you have that type of a, that type of an issue in your neighborhood, it, it affects a lot of, a lot of homeowners and not just the immediate neighbors. And so, uh, to me, it's all about being able to build a case, and th this is the way that's been pretty standardly accepted, um, and I believe I would um, possibly also through the municipal court systems that they under seem to understand home occupation regulations, and this is a pretty standard process. So everybody's grandfathered. No. No. They're Except operating. in this one unless they're violating some other code, except vehicle repair and service, repair of large appliances, sales and repair of firearms, ammunition, or explosives. So I don't think we have any of those at the current moment. Do we? Uh, we do have a um, lady who uh, 
has dogs and she, um, what's the word? Not breeds. Shampoos them and um, oh, in a residential. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Exactly. We mm -hmm. do have a lady who does that. That's she not. Yeah, but that's not, that's not prohibited. That can't be grandfathered. That's not on the list. Right. That can't be. That's legal, right? Now. Well, it says etc. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Would that the be only under ones that say they can't be grandfathered. This is under E, the second paragraph. Vehicle repair, repair of large appliances, sale and repair of fire, ammunition, and explosives. So we'd be looking at everybody who's currently in business and not. So violating say, say anything doing, else. Say being, I have a beauty okay. shop and I have an employee that doesn't live at my residence. Even that's grandfather. Grandfather in. So as far as disrupting the status quo, it's not. It's future. And again, we would be we would be building a case just because you you didn't realize that you needed to register. If if you got I mean, the way it's worded right now. If, if you went ahead and registered and showed us that you had a history at that location that would be fairly easy to do, uh, then we could establish and, and, and have that be part of that, uh, <coughs> part of the inventory that this was, that this was grandfathered as well. Mary, we've got a full presentation. I understand. This, uh, uh, yeah, oh. if, if, if there's yes, no further you. questions, I'd like to take about a five minute break. I sure. need myself. So is that all right with council? At 11.12, we'll take about a five-minute break. 11.15, and we'll go on with item number two, which is review, discuss, and provide direction regarding City of Kerrville traffic engineering study. So, Mayor and Council, we have uh, the study back. We had sent that to you, um, I think it was last week. There's another draft at your places. Um, and then we also have a, a presentation that really tracks with the, the study. Uh, giving some recommendations on multiple intersections that uh, you all have identified um, typically through one-on-one -on -one conversations that we need to take a look at this intersection or that intersection. In some cases, it's been the public that's uh, brought them up, uh, particularly the ones on uh, Shriner. So um, we have our engineering consultants here today to walk you through each of these. Uh, we are in a workshop environment because we just really want some general direction on how to proceed on these. Um, I'll say on the outset that you know, we don't have any money budgeted for a lot of this. Um, if it's small enough, we can do it in-house, like some striping and so forth. So when, you'll see, when you see some recommendations about curbing and this and that and the other, some of it we could do, some of it may be an, uh, a budget item for the next year, or maybe we just do striping initially and see how it works first. So um, they'll walk through that, and then we'll be glad to take any, any questions. Are, so. are, are the estimates that we're going to see the dollar amounts? based on that decision already being made that this is something we would do in-house and that's how we got the estimate? You, you have no. a little bit of both. Okay. They're All very right. rough estimates and some are actual medians and curbs and some are striping, so they'll, they'll have to kind of talk through a little yeah. bit okay. of that. All right. Okay, Jess? Well, good morning, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Jess Swaim. I'm Vice President of 6S Engineering. I'm the Prime Consultant and I've brought with me today Angel Gonzalez is a subconsultant with GKW Engineering. Uh, we've both been in the profession uh, quite a while now, about 17 years, and Angel's 19 or 20. We've been working together for a long time. Uh, I'm a general uh, agricultural, civil, environmental engineer. Uh, Angel does a lot of civil as well. He's also a specialist in traffic engineering, and, and I've brought him on board too aid and, and lend support in this project. And in this, in this project, our purpose was to study eight primary intersections here in Kerrville. And with that, we had uh, traffic data collection, uh, different evaluations that, that we performed. We pr uh, prepared some recommendations and some exhibits. I know that you're, you've got a hold of the report there. And uh, as we work through I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over. Oh, oh, there we go. Skip to slide. These are the, the existing locations that we looked at. Shriner and Hayes and Shriner and Clay, water and clay, water at Earl Garrett, water at G, and then the River Hill Corridor, which there were three primary intersections there. So I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Angel now as we get into some of the acronyms and special wording in the report and for our presentation. 
Mr. McDaniel, just clerical. It's okay that we have two council members that, that would be affected by your decisions today. Is that okay? Um, yeah. Mr. Hayes? I mean, in terms of a conflict of interest? Yeah. Um, As if it's, I don't if think it's, it's going to have a special economic effect okay. on their property. Or <laughs> their As opposed to my yeah. neighbors. Right. Yeah. No. It's going to be As the opposed same to, effect on yeah. me. Just, just, just checking and you have your own action. action. We're not taking action. No. Today, right? Oh, I thought we, you wanted direction. Well, I might just get some general, general. direction gotcha. on how to proceed from here. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, when it comes to the acronyms, basically I'm going to go through the three uh, main ones that we use uh, frequently in the, on the report. Um, highway capacity manual is basically the manual that is used by traffic engineers um, and provides to us the policies and protocols to follow as far as uh, evaluating intersections and corridor. The level of service that comes from the highway capacity manual and is basically how you will grade an intersection uh, from level of service A to level of service F, A being the best possible way that you can operate at an intersection with free flow and F when you really have some heavy congestion um, at, a, at the intersection with high, high uh, control delay. Control delay basically is the amount of seconds, that average seconds that a, a vehicle it's at the intersection approach waiting to be able to clear that intersection. So um, just when you read the, the report and you see control delay, that's what we're looking at. Um, Synchro model is basically a simulation software that it's used in our pro uh, profession. And it's, uh, it also works with the highway capacity manual. So this basically facilitates to us the process of, of uh, analyzing the intersection by using a micro simulation model. This also helps us out to evaluate alternative and be able to get forecast uh, level of service at those locations as well. So that said, um, we'll start with Triner. And one of the things um, that we noticed is when we got this, this assignment, we basically noticed that we're looking at three different corridor. We're looking at Shriner Corridor, Water Corridor, and the River Hill. So we a little bit expanded uh, our scope after we started looking at the, um, at the intersections because what we did notice is that when it comes to level of service, the operation of the actual intersection, we were getting good level of service, A, Bs, uh, for the majority and C. C is the worst that we that is acceptable or not so bad. It's, but basically, is the one that is acceptable during your peak time, because it's when you have your high the highest volume of traffic at a, at a location. Um, after uh, peak time in your off peak intersections tend to function um, between A and B in 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 this area basically. Um, so that. With that in mind, we look at Shriner at Hayes, and when we did this, we look at the existing condition of it. We uh, realized that we have a four-lane um, uh, four roadway on Shriner, two lane on each approach, and we have one lane uh, on each approach of Hayes. Based on turning movement counts and our analysis, the uh, intersection operates at a level of service A for all of the uh, peak time that we study. We study the a.m. peak time, the midday from 11 to 1, and p.m. from 4 to 6 p.m. The a.m. was from 7 to 9 performed. Can we ask then why there were 12 crashes there? That's the other component that we did, Mayor. Um, we first look at the intersection on, on uh, operation analysis, looking at how it operates. After we did that, we then decided to look a little bit more in depth in the crash analysis. Be we, we, what we felt is, okay, if they're asking us to look at this intersection is because there's something going on in here. It's not a level of service. It's not an operation issue. So we end up looking at a statewide um, uh, crash data report that it's, uh, they, the, the state does have. These are crashes that are, have been reported in the areas. They are, there is a possibility that the crash uh, numbers could be a little bit higher if they have not, they have not been reported yet. And, and in, in this particular intersection, like uh, Shriner and Hayes, there's a traffic signal. Do we know, because the accident count was high, 
when did we put that traffic signal in? Because were the accidents prior to the traffic signal? It's the last four years. It's, oh, well, it's 12 through 12 16. 12 to 16. But do we know when the light for a long, long time? Really? Yeah. The, the data of accident? Yeah, maybe longer. Anyways, okay. Okay, yes, in the data of accident, we just went back as far as five years only. Yeah. <clears throat> so when we look at the crash data, we did notice that the majority of those accidents that were occurring, they were rear-end accidents uh, off of Shriner. Uh, this means that more than likely a vehicle is trying to turn left while somebody else on that same lane wants to go through. Um, when we try to come out with a recommendation, one of the things that we did as well is we did 24-hour counts in the area. We wanted to know what is the amount of vehicles going through Shriner. And the reason of this is because in, in what we had in mind is to recommend what we call a road diet. Reduce the number of lane of your, of, of your uh, corridor so we can provide a continuous left turn lane. This, will, this what it will do is take away that movement from the through movement. But if I'm going to do this, I need to make sure that the number of vehicles per day does not exceed a certain amount, in this case, 12,000. 12, and the reason is because nationwide, different studies that we have done, um, that is the, the highest number that we will look into doing a road diet to a three lane section, from a four lane to a three lane section. Anything above 12,000, then it starts deteriorating what we discussed before, the level of service on each intersection. So you have 5,200? Yes, Mayor. So for this intersection, what we're recommending is what we just talked about, it's just to provide one lane in each direction uh, for Shriner and provide a dedicated left turn lane. <clears throat> what this will allow us well by doing this uh, road diet uh, uh, configuration, we will have sufficient pavement on both sides that we can use also for bike lane as well. This is something that we tend to do at other cities. Um, in this way, you can uh, put your bike, bike uh, cyclists away from the travel lanes. So that's something that you may want to consider as well. Did you, in the study, uh, you, you can tell our department, whom I assume could do this work, how far back you start those turn lanes, right? Yes, we do, Mayor. Yes, but, but it would be continuous. That's what we're going to look trying. at. Oh, okay. I guess. Yes, we did. Later. Yes. Okay. So yes, what well, we the way I did the presentation is we look at each intersection, but then at the end of the, of the Shriner, yeah. I'll give you uh, right. that what what would you just ask for? For Shriner Street, that one did we we did get a level of service C during the PM time. Um, this intersection, as many of you know, it operates as a two-way intersect, two-way stop sign, uh, where Shriner is free flow. We we have the same scenario. We have two lane in each in each direction approach for Shriner, and uh, ironically, we had the same amount of accidents at this location as well as as the one where we have a, a traffic signal. Mm -hmm. S uh, the majority of those accidents, same type, rear end accidents. Uh, T, there were some T-bones as well. Uh, when it came to the level of service C, what uh, the approach that we were having, the worst level of service is your northbound uh, coming in uh, from Clay, approaching the intersection. Um, one of the things that I was very concerned about this intersection is that it's located at a, at a curve area, mm -hmm. um, which could impede some sight distance issue. So we, we look at three different options on this one uh, to see how we can provide you the best alternative. The option one, it was just I'm made. sorry, when you do these three options, is that uh, the proposed level of service, you give a performance evaluation for each option, is that right? That is correct. When you do the turn lanes, it's a C, even after you do those? That is correct. Okay. And, and the reason is because even with the turn lane, yes, we, we, the one that we're going to benefit the most in there is just the, the Shriner, because we're providing those turn lanes for Shriner. So for Shriner, yet yeah, better level of service or better control delay than we did on, on uh, sorry, Clay Street. Um, <coughs> that's why for, for option one, basically, the only one benefiting from that is those peop those vehicles that are on Shriner only. 
Option B, um, we were looking into um, controlling uh, turning movements and making clay into a right turn in, right turn out only type of movement. Uh, one of the things that we looked at this before I came out, uh, we came out with the idea, is we looked at the uh, our good area of the of the area to make sure that those people that are, that tend to turn left in here that they have an immediate location that they can continue to do this movement without affecting their travel time so much. And what we notice is in an, in this area we we have a good grid system where we have blocks and each of those blocks they connect to Shriners so we can see that their travel time is not going to be affected as much. Their distance to travel will not be affected as much. And what we're doing is rerouting them to do the, the left turn movement at a location where they have better sight distance and to, re to reduce the, um, the probability of, of having an accident at, at, at this location. Of course, you would put them, the next street over is Quinlan, and you had six accidents there. Yes, correct. Those ac again, those accidents are occurring because of those the rear end type of accident. So with uh, with this uh, continuous uh, turn, mm -hmm. correct. Right. With this improvement, in addition to the continuous left turn lane, so that will definitely help reduce your amount of accidents in the area. The option B definitely gave us good level of service. We have level of service B for the morning, A in the midday, and B for the PM. So this is uh, a good, a, a viable uh, solution to, to the location. The next one is the uh, appropriate installation of a runabout. Um, this runabout that, that we designed in here, or basically pro provided a schematic, it will uh, give the full uh, turning movement to all the approaches, but basically on a roundabout location. This will help out also uh, for uh, traffic speed, to reduce speed in the area. Um, it will take away the uh, sight distance issue. And the roundabout, as far as the, the, the size of the roundabout, will accommodate a uh, larger vehicle and I'm comparing this to River Hill. River Hill, we call those mini roundabouts in, in a subdivision this setting. Would be more like the one at the Shrine and Golf Course. Yes, we, we discussed that, and yes, that is correct. And, and who owns that property we would need? What's it being used for? Different, four different owners, mm -hmm. I think. Well, the back to the left is the um, beverage bar. But uh, I believe that's Mr. Fogg next yeah. to it, isn't it? No. 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 Yeah, beverage Born, it's the, the guy that has oh, no, UPS. Next, next door, right? Yeah, next door. And then the glass, the rails, and then um, they bought it from Miss Balding. The air conditioning people are whatever. It just doesn't look like anybody else is affected as greatly as that one on the upper left hand. And I do want to point out yeah. this diagram does have the purple indication is sidewalk. That wouldn't necessarily be necessary within. I mean, it could be if that was, uh, but that's not necessarily a, a right of way acquisition that would be needed to accommodate uh, oh, the, the, the area circle. in the oh, blue, okay. and just the circle. That's okay. right. That does turn it back. The right of way needs a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I really like that option. For this alternative, yeah, the low. I think it looks pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> I have the, Excuse me. I have the owners. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> been stuck. contacted Not at this point. <laughs> well yeah. prematurely yeah, we, okay. we wanted to garner okay. direction gotcha. before we we did that gotcha for this alternative our level of service was a on all oh, uh, sure. uh <laughs> yeah. so when it comes to the uh shrine corridor uh the the what we're proposing as far as the restriping as a three lane uh we're providing you here that the limits and we're giving you the limits from Francisco Lemos to all the way to Washington Street. This uh, basically um, uh, goes through the Sydney Baker uh, intersection. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Why uh, did you put resurfacing in there? Resurfacing is you t typically uh, recommended. So basically, it's to provide a new canvas so we can do the new striping, and people don't get confused because when you try to to take out the uh, the old striping. It always leave a, it leaves a mark. 
Um, so what we tend to do is just do, we do a, a microsurfacing uh, uh, treatment and yeah, Jess is, is an ex expert when it comes to that. Um, and then after that, then we provide the new striping. It's not a full repavement. Mm -mm. It would just be taking off the, the very top layer yeah. to make sure that we don't have confusion Over with the old stripes. Uh, yes, do we have any of that on our um, resurfacing plan? That would be Street similar plan. to our slurry seal. Uh, so we would have to incorporate that into the new one. So we'd have to maybe sure, replace part of, of that. Slurry seal anytime soon. Done some of it. Hayes, mm -hmm. Rodriguez, and some of it. We did some of it. See, that's what I'm asking. We've already done some of Shriner. Yeah. yeah, and there's parts of it that are, are not striped or, or barely striped. Like so we would have, have to work about it across that corridor and see the condition of the current striping. That's assuming every all of that is done outside, none of that in house. That price, that um, estimate. Yes, more than gotcha. yes. Yes. Okay. After Triner, we move on to Water Street Corridor, and we started with water and clay. Uh, same situation here. When we did the level of service, we were getting acceptable level of service during the peak times. Our level of service at this location, I believe there were between A's and B. Um, but what we did is we looked at it, and what we realized that the main issue in here is the site distance issue. Uh, we look at crash analysis in here, and somehow th there's only two that have been registered. Uh, that, uh, I'm not too sure if that number is correct in, in the state data, um, because to me the, the issue that we have in there is, is quite serious. Um, in this one, again, when it comes to the payment markings, they're faded in this area. Um, we're recommending to do similar to what we're recommending at Shriner to provide left turn lane into it. Also moving the, the curb so we can move the stop sign and stop bar of, of clay so we can provide the site distance required at this location for a 30 mile per hour uh, uh, road. I drive to when I'm making a turn and the stop sign. Your, your stop really sign that far is, back? Yeah, your, your existing stop sign is actually where, where it shows right there. Okay. It's a, just a little bit behind the, there's a fire hydrant, uh -huh. and then just behind the fire hydrant, about two or three feet behind the fire hydrant. Let me ask you, if you just put, for now, a stop sign on the water street on the westbound corner by the parking garage, so that they had to stop there, and then they had to stop entering from clay. I didn't Would ask her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> we have gone back and forth on that, that um, oh. Mayor. And and of course, there's there's always an administrative uh, uh, decision that that can be made over a traffic engineering report. When it comes to a traffic engineering report, um, looking at an always stop sign, we have to do what is called a warrant analysis, and we have to follow certain rules and protocols to, to do this. And what we're looking at is doing a comparison of your volume of the major major street versus the volume of the main of your minor street, and they give us a threshold on what those volumes needs to be to meet that warrant. When it comes to a warrant, it does not meet. But there's always a administrative decision that you can you can definitely recommend it, and that could be done. But from the traffic engineering perspective, what we did is come out with a solution that can benefit the vehicular movement and at the same time also what it looks to be a, a pedestrian increase in the area. And with this imp uh, recommendation that we're providing, we're reducing the pavement width of Water Street at this location, which in entail that this will help to reduce speed um, also, when you have pedestrians crossing, um, this also reduces the length that they have to cross, and then we can provide a pet refuge as well. So that way, when they're crossing the street, they, can on they only have to be concerned about one direction instead of having to worry about both directions.
Oh, what's about, what about the de detector? Are you not there yet? I mean, we don't have that on um, water. And, oh, that's Earl Garrett. Never mind. Mm -hmm. we'll move, we'll, that's the next one. Yes, on Water Street at Earl. I uh, apologize I didn't provide a, a, an aerial for it. Um, but in that particular intersection, we the same thing. You know, after uh, our study, uh, when we look at that intersection by itself <laughs> on the, on the software, it doesn't have any issues. We have good level of service. When we come out here and look at the what the actual issue is, the issue is caused by the next light um, that it's very close to this intersection, okay. which is the one at Sydney Bakers and, and Waters. Yeah. Um, what it's going, what's happening here is that your intersection that, that, you, that the city controls, it's operated as a, as a pre-time. It doesn't have detection uh, uh, systems. Also, it's not coordinated with the Texas Department of Transportation uh, signal. So there's got to be a coordination with TxDOT, and that's basically what we're trying, what we're recommending is we need, we need to have coordination with TxDOT on, on these two signals. So one entity will operate both, and both signals can be synchronized properly so we can have proper progression th throughout this intersection. For what I've seen, Sydney Baker at uh, Water does need some in in attention. Um, I saw uh, quite amount of accident at that location, um, and I think that it needs to be brought up to text dot attention that there's a safety issue at that in in that location right there. We did that already, didn't we, staff? Yeah. Yeah, they've gone through. They've done some upgrades to the controller right. uh, with the recent one that uh, got hit right. uh, by a vehicle uh, that, that also came into our uh, development services building. So they've done some upgrades. Uh, they're still refining there, uh, and certainly this can piggyback uh, onto that to, to try to get those synced up better. So we want to know on the drive-through for uh, deliver, uh, development service? At least in that style, yes, sir. Okay, all right. <laughs> So for this intersection, the primary recommendation is coordination with TxDOT and that both signals operate and communicate with each other. Um, the second recommendation is, is th that is also needed is the video detection, some type of detection on, on the signal. The, this could be with the video cameras that goes on top of this, the mast arms like you have on other uh, signals, or it could be with radar. Um, we need to provide a cost to this to, to the city staff. We haven't done that yet. Um, and we will be providing that probably within the next couple of days. Um, the other thing is that if we don't have push button in that area, as far as pedestrian uh, face, we should also consider pedestrian face because we did see during, during the field data collection, we did see quite a bit of uh, pedestrian in that area. There's, you, you do have, a, a, I believe, a public parking right in front of. They are okay. Yeah. Well then, my my apologies. I I, I wasn't aware. Um, I was here. I didn't see, <laughs> I didn't get to see it. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so moving on to Water G Street. This is the most critical intersection that we looked at of all eight intersections that we study. Um, Water G Street definitely do, does have uh, some crashes in this area. Uh, what we saw was a very significant uh, queuing in, on G Street um, going northbound. Um, the control delay is definitely ex exceeding uh, uh, what it will be for a level service C. I mean, we, we saw uh, vehicles uh, waiting Three up to three minutes yes. to four minutes sometimes to be able to clear the intersection. So definitely, this is an intersection that does require uh, some type of immediate uh, attention. Mm -hmm. We conducted a signal warrant, traffic signal warrant, and at this time, it doesn't meet a traffic signal warrant. Um, we do anticipate that in the near future it will. Um, and typically, what it's recommended in, in, in locations like this is to move up upgrade from a two-way stop sign to a always stop sign. Um, knowing and, and, and continue to monitor the intersection within the next two to three years, more than likely, because of, you know, if you continue to grow um, at a fast pace, then this is something that needs to be monitored probably every two to three years 
because I, I, I would expect that this could be within five to 10 years, it will meet a traffic signal, and that's what would the uh, ultimate recommendation will be at this location. So how much is a traffic signal as opposed to this $45,000 fix here? Traffic signal, well, the 45,000 will still be needed because that's primarily your restriping. Still need the turn lanes. Correct, you right. still need the turn lane and everything. Um, you will have to add a traffic signal cost, which is between 185 to 200,000. Okay. But with the recommendation, our level of service did uh, get better and, and they were more acceptable between level service B and C. B. You will st still see some queuing, but definitely um, much uh, 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 better than what we have right now, I guess. Yeah, it's a terrible intersection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's enough room on the pavement on G Street on the south side of water to do essentially Turn. split it across three lanes? Yes, we can do that. Um, basically, we're reducing the size of, of your lanes. Right now, your size of the, of the lane, I think there were about 15 feet to 16 feet. So <clears throat> I think you, you do have uh, a pavement width of about 33 feet. So what we're doing is making the lanes 11, about uh, around 11 feet. So let's say like a UPS truck gonna be able to make that turn yes. off of water onto G? Yes, that's not going to be an it's issue. We, we go as low as 10 feet okay. on, on lanes. And um, we try to be desirable at 12. That, that's what the desirable is, but our minimum is 10 feet. Okay. I would expect peak time is your worst time, but I've been there at a lot of peak times, and you do wait forever. And I would think it would be a good idea to look at budgeting in the future for a light there. I, I think that that would be very wise to do because I, I do see the, the need for it. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you can see the, in the picture, you've got, you catch a car that's going yeah. where they're going to normally go, which is why. In the middle. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, anyways. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. River Hill um, Corridor, again, what we notice in there, this is not a level of service issue. You. Mm -hmm. It's not whatsoever. What we did encounter uh, on being out uh, in the field, uh, illegal movements, <laughs> primarily. It's it's what we we encounter. You pulled them all over, right? Excuse me. You pulled them all over, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. I think what we do is do all these corrections. He says, and then park. Don't do River Hill. Park a cop there because we won't <laughs> need him at these other places and collect the money that will pay for money. these other things. <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> so in here, yes, what we, we notice is that um, uh, the roundabout itself, without proper channelization of the approaches, uh, it's not go it's not working properly. Payment marking, it's not working properly. Uh, uh, and it's not being effective. Is what I mean. The payment markings are there to try to ch to to ha guide the the vehicle vehicles, <coughs> the, the motorists, but they're not really paying attention to the payment marking. All they see is an opening, and they go <laughs> for it. So, <laughs> yep. this one was the fun one. I <laughs> so we should have deputized you. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in here, what basically what we're trying to, our recommendation is basically to provide proper signalization of all the approaches that will force them to make the movement that the runabout is, is intended to, to be used as. Um, so all three uh, uh, recommendations that we're doing is basically adding curb, um, adding race median as well. Uh, and the most important one, because these are mini runabout, the inner circle that we have that look like a planner, we definitely recommend those to be taken out as well. Um, we need to make sure that we make the intersection also available and accessible to larger vehicles. The mini runabout function is, is to move the traffic that you will have in a, on a daily basis. Uh, regular vehicles, trucks, uh, like pickup trucks is what I mean. But you, ten, you do have to make sure that those intersections are accessible for 18-wheelers when they have to go through here, and more importantly, 
emergency vehicles. School buses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Traffic. Correct. Traffic. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Forget yeah. it on my street. They can't get on. They can get on. Exactly. So what is recommended when you have a mini runabout, the inner circle that you have is supposed to have a mountable curb. So that way those vehicles right. that tend to go through there maybe once a day, that they have that accessibility to mount on top of the curb and do the movement. Um, emergency vehicles, the same thing. Emergency vehicles have a, a wider wheelbase. And we need to make sure that we can accommodate them to go through there without any issues so they can get to where they need to get. <coughs> so these are the recommendations as far as the, the race median and payment marking. Also, uh, in addition to those payment marking and race median, proper signage uh, for the approaches of, of each, uh, for, for each of the approaches to the, to the runabout. So now I guess if, if you guys have any additional qu questions regarding our recommendation. My comment would be when we go to the safety issues first, like uh, Shriner Street, I love the idea of those turn lanes all the way down because um, that's where we have the, the safety issues, which is costly. Yeah, and G Street more. Yes, absolutely, G Street. Um, that intersection, I like the idea at the parking garage of just trying a stop sign in both areas, moving that forward, if you will, and then putting one, rather than doing all of that expensive stuff right now. Because um, the roundabout is a great idea, the Clay Street and Shriner Street, but that's the most costly. But yeah, we'd want to talk to the property owners. That's yeah, absolutely. Well. That'd be number one. You know, I agree with you at the Water Street and Clay Street. The only concern that I have is that you have a lot of cut traffic. And they could stack, if there's enough of it, back up into the mm -hmm. City Baker intersection. Yes, I'd, I'd I thought you were just going to have it in the other direction, coming towards City Baker. You'd have to have all way. All way. Three all way stop. three. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, his, his proposal was to just have it on Sorry. on Two Clay, yes. entering right. Sydney Baker. Mm -hmm. They're talking about adding stops on the but Sydney ba or the it water is street. Is possible to put a stop sign only on the Sydney Baker bound side of Water Street, so that you stack up back toward Francisco Lamus, which is a long way. Mm -hmm. There was any stacking. I, I, I don't think I we're talking about yeah, the same place. Yeah, yeah it, it would be confusing, I think, to motorists too. See, on, on, on the Clay, on the Clay um, Water Street intersection, I, I like what they propose, but I would take away the uh, pedestrian refuge um, only because of the, the thing I mentioned, the, the parade. parade. And I'm not sure how much benefit, I, I mean, I. I don't know. Yeah, my, I, this one I thought a lot about, and I've even had discussions with Vincent, I think, about it. Is, I mean, it, it's dangerous coming out of there yeah. the way it is yeah. today. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest that we do, at least initially, is where we you see all the blue in these photos for new curve, yeah. that's just basically markings at this point. We, stripe you know, it. we go mm -hmm. in, we stripe it, mm -hmm. try to narrow the lane with stripes um, to slow the traffic down. Um, you know, that's not going to be as expensive. Try it that way. But I think down the road, and especially if we get the Shell Hayes house um, usable and, and more traffic through that area, that the pedestrian count is going to warrant eventually mm -hmm. of always stop. But right now, you know, given the recommendation from the traffic engineer that we, we go with, as you suggested, what they recommended, yeah. but not do curb, do paint. Okay. Except maybe on that one area where the stop sign is on clay, so that you need to move that stop sign up. Yeah. yeah. How, place how expensive are those big yellow reflector things like at Riverdale? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. They're pretty expensive. They you really don't save a lot from that compared to the what the curb is. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, we, are we going to be leaving those in Riverdale? Can you reuse those or no? Those, all those ones that are there now, we would, we would if, if we just stripe in you know, no new curb, we would keep them there and do additional striping beyond what's already there. Are you back to River Hill? No, I was just River Hill because those 
big we yellow things. I didn't know instead of doing a curb, we can put those there because those really wake you up. But we removed them at the first one coming off of 173, uh, but they're still at the other locations, and I don't think they're the larger ones in some of the other locations. Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. I, I mean, we could reuse them, but we, I'd prefer we just keep them where they are and do additional painting, including what was suggested to me at the River Hill HOA meeting is painting arrows actually on the pavement, indicating where the traffic is supposed to go around people aren't going to. <laughs> you know, I just hate to spend a whole lot more money on those things. At this I, point. I, I, would not, I would not Absolutely. spend money to put paint on the no, ground no, if they're going to be doing this with the, the thing. How much did I, that cost uh, originally? Um, yeah, who proposed that? <clears throat> we need to collect all the solutions we've tried. Can you reuse the brick yeah. in the middle? <laughs> we can do and, and decorator. One, several have been rebuilt multiple times. The one at my location has been rebuilt four or five times. Is that the driver's insurance to pay for that? Or is that yes, sir. I hope so. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so could you come back to us with a, a cost of... Really? The Shriner. <laughs> well, the one, the one that uh, just happened most recently, the other issue that we have at that location is the lighting is very poor. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at another street light there. That's up there. Um, is it Spring Hill? No, that's Canterbury. 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 Mm -hmm. Canterbury. Take the one that's off the corner of my house because it lights up my house. Uh, do you think that option B on the Shriner and Clay, where it just has the median, uh, that's a twenty thousand dollar rather than a roundabout, that gives you a B A B. Is, do you have any problems with that? Or? I have a concern that the business owners in that area are going to object to it. But Before we stop. No, no, the it's a big median that prohibits the left. Turn. Go north and south on yeah. Well, you still yeah. can't do it with a roundabout either. I think, I mean, yeah, I, just go ahead. No, you would. You would go yeah. around. You can't access, yeah. But on the Shriner Clay one, you that to me is, is a decision. I mean, a roundabout would be ideal, okay? Mm -hmm. But if we're talking something that's 120 or something thousand dollars or even more, I, I would go with the restriction, uh, restricting the clay movement. Um, for the business owners, like he said, it won't take us but a very short amount of time. People realize they make their left at the block mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing at, uh, was it Avenue B or A or whatever it is in Broadway, where there's a, you can't go a certain way, and so people do it. My concern with the restriction is, okay, it's up there, is that somebody's gonna come down, coming down um, Shriner, no, they're gonna come down Shriner, and they, they wanna go left on Clay. So instead of going left a block early, they're going to start going left into whatever that business is. Right. It's right on the corner. Mm -hmm. And then there's an alley, because I think there's an alley yeah. right behind. So mm -hmm. they could do that. And that would be my biggest concern if we got that type of maneuvering going With on. the roundabout, do you put stop signs there? Is that what you have over there at, at the golf course? So that oh, yield, 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 so that you mm -hmm. can go all the way around mm -hmm. into the other yeah. Absolutely. incoming yeah, lane. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm hearing that the roundabout's the preferred option, Correct. notwithstanding, um, you know, after we hear from cost. the cost and also here. The, the owners, owners, the landowners. But, so we'll, we'll look at that as the preferred yeah. option. And um, we'll, I'm not hearing any objection to any of these. Um, at least yet. Is there any objection to any of this? So. No, I just on the roundabout when we're talking about on Clay and Shriner, did those bushes come up at all? Because I know that restricts my view when I'm looking to the right to see if there's any traffic. Yeah. Is there anything we, we can... If we put the sidewalk in there, you have to come out. Yeah. Like the big ones aren't that bad. It's just those low bushes and they actually park up to that so you yeah. can't mm -hmm. see anything to the right. Yeah, we've worked with them to do some trimming to, to enhance the site visibility. As, as best it can, but you're right, they, for a, particularly on a low vehicle, it is difficult to see over that. But, mm -hmm. but a circle. Oh, yeah, but I was just saying in the meantime. For is on your left, sure that, that is correct. That is correct. And if any part of that on the Shriner that we've already done could be utilized, it would be nice. That we've already resurfaced. And, and mm -hmm. clar clarification on it, it is, well, it's that one. So the Shriner Street, as it continues on to Sydney Baker, Prior to 
this roundabout spot, we're going with this continuous turn lane. As it gets to the light at Sidney Baker, is it a dedicated? That is correct, lane? yes. So it's, it's something a little bit different than. Yes, the it will be a left turn lane. Uh, the left turn only. Left turn only, yes. Okay. Uh, a continuous left turn lane when it goes approaches the as, as the signal intersection yeah. then that will become a, a left turn only and then you have one uh, through movement and, and through and right this door direction from city baker on shriner is that going to be one lane the whole way or is it going to be two that merges into one real fast you know, on the immediately area. turning yeah if you, you immediately if, turn say i'm coming on shriner street across city baker where the police station Yes. And I come across, is it going to be one lane as one. soon as I cross City Baker? No. It's going to, that's why the transition will start, we will start at Washington Street, which is on the other side of City Baker. Okay. All right. So, all right. So it will be one lane next yes. to Jack in the yeah, Box. Yeah. The whole that is correct. You start across the okay. road. Oh. Good. Because we didn't see that. Mayor, I need to go to a phone call with the bond rating agency for our refunding. Okay. So okay. EA can take over. Okay. Um, what I'd like to, I like all of these too. I'd like to see what the package price is going to be and where it's going to come from, and that'd be sure. our decision. Sure. And then uh, establish our priority list, mm -hmm. and then kind of when we could, which yeah. which ones are the most yeah. expedient. Yeah. You know? So what we can do, we can take your feedback from this morning, uh, and we'll, we'll work with uh, Mr. Swain, and Mr. Gonzalez, uh, to kind of tighten up the cost estimates and uh, bring that back to this group and kind of prioritize based off of your feedback today. Uh, and, and bring that back to you guys for further direction on how you'd like us to proceed. That sounds and, good. And have I understood everybody's more in favor of, of uh, doing paint first? And doing which foot paint? The, instead of the curbing. If, if, instead of curbing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll tighten up as well the, you know, the options that we have for uh, doing that in-house versus right. uh, you know contracting that out and try to get some estimates there. Again, the you know the same guys that are doing the striping are the ones that that you know, do a lot of our uh, street work, and so uh, we know that there's a concern there and being able to maximize our street work. So we'll try to provide some time frames of just kind of what kind of man hours that may look mm -hmm. like as well. Okay, that sounds good. Any further questions? And thank you, gentlemen, for coming thank today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will then adjourn at 12:01.